Thank you for downloading this Real Agriculture podcast. Next thing you know, you know the next thing. Next is Now is a short podcast discussing agriculture's emerging next-gen tech and trends as they're happening in our industry. Next is Now, presented by GFL Ag. Listen where you get your podcasts today. I'm Sean Haney, and this is Real Ag on the Weekend. Let's get real and get connected with the week that was in Canadian agriculture. Real Ag on the Weekend starts now. Welcome, everybody, to Real Ag on the Weekend here on 650 CKOM and 980 CJME. I'm your host, Sean Haney of realagriculture.com. It is great to be with you here on the weekend. Hope you had yourself a great week, no matter what happened. You're, You're prepping for spring. You could be calving. There's a lot happening at this time of the year as uh, we get a little bit closer to what we call actual spring. I I was actually in Saskatchewan this week, and I had a great time. I was out at the Dakota Dunes Resort outside of Saskatoon and was able to uh, do an event with Cargill Market Sense. We had a really, really great time. Fantastic audience. And and I, I said to the group that was there, there was like 250 farmers, I said... You, like, maybe the best crowd that I have spoke to the entire winter. They were there to have fun, to learn, to ask great questions. They laughed at my jokes, which, as a speaker, is, like, super important. (laughs) We had a great time. So uh, I really, really enjoyed myself. And there's a little bit of snow in Saskatoon. And it's very, very interesting as well, though. When I talk to farmers across the province... You, you really get a handle on the variability in terms of the conditions that are out there. I talked to Jocelyn Wasco from East End, Saskatchewan, on uh, Real Ag Radio on Thursday on our Farmer Rapid Fire. And she talked you know, very optimistically about some of the pasture conditions, the moisture that they did have, because there was a big dump of snow that went through there. So a real sense of optimism. I heard from some other growers that talked to me from different parts of the country, that, or sorry, different parts of the province, that, that said, yeah, it's, it's a little dry snow. There's not a lot of fluff to it. We still need that big, big, wet snow yet. I heard from some others that said, hey, you know what? I, I think we're going to be okay, at least to get the crop into the ground, but we're going to need those rains early. So depending on where you are, you're feeling a little bit different here at this point, the midpoint of, of, of March already. But uh, great to see everybody that uh, was able to attend that event on on Thursday and really, truly had a a fantastic, great time. Great stuff. Okay, uh, today on Real Ag on the Weekend, we're going to hear from Ed Brashinsky. Now, Ed is a market analyst with Cargill Market Sense. He appeared with me on the the Real Ag radio show, and uh, we we dived into kind of – how would Ed describe the current market environment? What do I do about it? What are the indicators to be watching? So I'm going to bring you that audio here today. We're also going to hear some audio that I did earlier this week with J.P. Gervais, Chief Economist with Farm Credit Canada, talking about the land value report that FCC put out this week for 2023. And at a time where we're seeing interest rates relatively higher than we've experienced in, in quite some time, they're, they're holding... At, at these levels, okay, it looks like the Bank of Canada is done raising rates, but the question is really more so when will they start to decrease rates? That is yet to happen here in this year. And there's also concern about farmer profitability. But, but, <laughs> farmers are still buying land. It's a little bit of a secret, but I'm, I'm here to expose it for you. Yes, uh, land values continue to go up, not just in Saskatchewan, which really led the nation in percentage increase, okay, but the rest of the country as well, outside of only British Columbia, which did decline. So we'll do that. And then we're going to talk a little bit about how important trade is and, and to you, okay? So what we did was we... At Real Agri Studies, the market research arm of, of Real Agriculture, we asked Canadian farmers how important certain policies are to your success. So do they have a positive impact, or negative impact? And there was different ratings. And 
Uh, we're going to talk about trade today and how the Canadian farmer views the importance of trade to their operations. If you have any feedback on today's show, I'd love to hear from you. Send me an email, shaney at realagriculture.com. You can also find us across all the different social media channels, or you are also welcome to call the Real Ag Feedback Line. That number is 855 776 Six one four seven. You know, speaking of trade, some not great news this week. I don't know if you heard about it, but uh, the USDA on Monday came out with their final rule on the product of USA labeling, and this is uh, this is of concern to Canada. This is of concern, of course, to the the pork industry, the beef industry. This is a, a very restrictive label. So now we're dealing with a situation where in order for a package or a, a, a you, know, you go to the grocery store and you see that product of USA label, it now has to be, that animal now has to be born, raised, slaughtered, and processed in the United States to have that product of USA label on it. Earlier this week, I had a chance to catch up with Dennis Laycraft, Executive Vice President at the Canadian Cattle Association. That interview is posted at realagriculture.com. You can also hear it on the Real Ag Radio podcast. Here's a, a clip of what Dennis had to say. You know, if we start to see that level of segregation again on imported animals, then that starts to move us to where we can say this, this rule is having the same impact that M. Cool had. And so we'll be gathering and watching that very closely. Um, and, you know, certainly that'll become more apparent as the rule uh, gets closer to coming into effect. And that implementation period will be 20 months. So Canada's going to be standing by, paying attention on terms of is this voluntary or is this really just an actual mandatory rule that or kind of just by default and Canada does retain that ability to retaliate under that WTO ruling if the, the level of segregation and harm is caused. So lots to pay attention to and follow. Thought that the Canadian government's response from Minister Ng and Minister, and Minister McCauley was rather, it, it kind of lacked, it, it really did lack the response of, uh, what a little bit more, edge i thought to the response it was, it was i thought it was kind of weak so let's take a break when we come back on real Ag of the weekend we're going to hear from ed brashinsky right after this if you're involved in the agriculture industry it's important to stay informed on all the latest issues affecting your business at realagriculture.com we offer fast reliable news information and insights to help you keep on top of all of the latest in canadian agriculture visit realagriculture.com and sign up for our free daily newsletter covering everything from news agronomy animal agriculture and much more visit realagriculture.com forward slash subscribe today there's a reason we call it the Corn School. Videos on everything from planter setup to weed control, field trial results, and the latest yield strategies. The Corn School on realagriculture.com has the information and advice you need to help you succeed. Brought to you by Pride Seeds and BASF. Corn School episodes are available at cornschool.com. From realagriculture.com or as a podcast in your favorite podcast app, check out the latest Corn School episode today. Next thing you know, you know the next thing. Next is now is a short podcast discussing agriculture's emerging next generation tech trends as they are happening in the industry. Next is now presented by GFL Ag. Listen where you get your podcast today. As I mentioned, I was in Saskatoon, Saskatchewan on Thursday with Cargill Market Sense. Had a chance to talk to Ed Brashinsky. He's one uh, one of their leading market analysts at Cargill. And for the Real Ag Radio podcast, him and I talked about the current market situation and trying to get a handle on where we go from here. You know, being a market analyst, I don't know, easy job when the market's like a hockey stick. These are a little bit more of troubling times. If I was to ask you to describe today's commodity market environment in one word, what word would you use? Uh, bearish. Bearish. That's, that, it's that simple. That's the one word I would use. Okay, that's fair. No, that, that is fair. Um, 
It's the word that I have been using as well. Um, we know, uh, coming out of commodity class, like I was down in Houston, and it became very, very clear a couple weeks ago, there is a lot of unsold 23 corn. It's also becoming very apparent in Canada, there's a lot of unsold 23 canola. And in both cases, what I hear from farmers is, you know, if I'm selling 23 corn or canola today, and probably some other commodities too, I'm selling it at a loss, and I'm not going to do that. I feel like there's a lot of people very much trapped right now in that dis- kind of decision making. Is that is that fair or? Yeah, I agree with you that there's a lot of feeling like it's a loss. I think one of the challenges is actually determining whether or not it is. I mean, you can use last year's production numbers, last year's costs, and that will give you a different view potentially than forecasting next year's costs, right? Yeah. Next year's yields and, and that sort of thing. So there always is a bit of a risk premium, right? You, you want to have a bit of a buffer on the new crop because you don't know what the yield's going to be. You don't know what, it's gonna, what that result's going to be. So it might feel today like those prices aren't profitable. Right. It, hold, I call it holder's regret. And it, like, I, I sympathize with farmers because you know, what we have seen in some of our sentiment index data is – Farmers' confidence in their marketing has, has is de- been declining as the market moves lower, which makes sense. But their outlook on which direction the market is headed is bouncing all over the place. It, it, it's been a real, real challenge to kind of sort this out. And because we're coming off of, say, three years where any kind of news seemed to just sort of lift the market higher, we had some people out there that were saying new normal. I always say if anybody says new normal, you kick them in the butt because they've just jinxed everything and ruined it. Mm-hmm. Um, this week earlier, or this, earlier this week, we had the acreage reports or the estimates from Statistics Canada. Take any issue with some of their forecasts or thoughts they have on some of the given crops? I, I don't really take any issue with it. Actually, the estimates were more or less in line with expectations. I think the important thing to remember is that survey was done in December. And so, you know, the price environment has changed since then. There's probably some different acreage intentions today. And the other thing is, too, is that even from today until seeding, those acreage intentions will probably change yet again. So the only issue would be just that there's so much time still to make a a decision Mm -hmm. that almost certainly we'll see some changes in the numbers. And I think as much as we talk about, hey, changes to your rotation this year, and we are, you know, oats definitely big time up, chickpeas definitely up, uh, lentils were up, field peas were up, uh, wheat down, canola down. Um, As much as we talk about some of those movements, we don't have a lot of fluctuation in acres as much as, say, maybe the Midwest, where I'm, you know, going to move more of my corn acre into beans and vice versa, depending on the, the, the acres can shift a lot more. It doesn't happen as much here, I think. Um, it doesn't happen as much with kind of the big crops, right? Like wheat and canola, you see smaller nominal changes. But there is, you know, significant changes, like you said, in oats, right? And we have seen in the past where we've seen a major swing into lentils um, in, in about 10 years ago, and, and especially, too, into different varieties within that lentil, right? Green lentils, probably going to see a big acreage increase. Green peas is another one, right? If you can get seed. If you can get seed, yeah. Yep. yeah. And, and I think the other cap on the pulse acre, and this is, again, my just – you're the analyst. I'm just reading tea leaves, um, is phytomyces and, and root rot being uh, – I think that's kind of a cap as well on, and as well that shortage of uh, potential seed out there for people to really increase the acre based on the market, mm-hmm. what the market's telling them to do. The one that I wondered about, though, Ed, is the canola acre. Mm-hmm. I still think it's going to be lower than – I think it was down 3.5% to $21 million and change. I, I, I think we're going to have a 20 in front of it. Mm-hmm. Well, I, I think that definitely the sentiment since the survey was done in December, I'll, I'll, I'll be honest with you, I was surprised to see the acreage actually come down as much as it did in the December report. Interesting. And then now, um, probably the sentiment has, has declined even more about wanting to put that canola acre in. Now, of course, in the last couple of weeks we've seen the canola market rally by a buck and a half a bushel so what if that if that were to continue would we see then more acres come back into canola i don't know um i think it's relative right to where's wheat at that day where's yeah. barley at that sort of thing too i was speaking at an event in Cam- where was i last camrose was one of the places i was last week and uh it's been a traveling road show as of late uh, but i was in camrose 
And I had a grower come up to me and sort of ask the question, what gets us out of this current bearish environment like you just mentioned? Mm -hmm. Is it weather being terrible somewhere? Like we have you know, a terrible crop in the Midwest or a terrible South America crop or Ukraine and Russia can't harvest wheat or whatever. Or is it demand has to lead us out of this? What's your thought? Uh, it's, it's a combination of both. When you go into a stock building phase like this, it's in response to high prices, right? Low stocks in previous years. So now we're, we're going to push probably, you know, to the other extreme where we build stocks, you know, overabundant stocks, burdensome stocks. We push prices perhaps even lower than the cost of production, right? To take acres out of production, to take production down. And then, of course, those lower prices incentivize demand. So we'll see demand start to come in. That's a normal reaction. These cycles, though, of reduced production in response to low prices and increased demand in response to low prices, those are multi-year cycles because the crop year, once you put that grain in the ground, it's going to be with you for the next 12 months, maybe longer. Mm. So these cycles take longer to play out sometimes than I, I think we would hope. Um, but eventually, you know, we're looking at probably a, a two-year, three-year cycle here to get back out of this, uh, what we're in right now. You, two, three months or two, three years? Two, three two, years. Two, three years. That's what he said. Yeah. Okay. Boo, Ed. Everybody <laughs> boo, Ed. <laughs> <laughs> I, no, I, I, want, I want to couch that, though. Um, getting out of this yeah. to a new bull market, that's probably the timeline that you're Fair. after, right? Um, getting into a more stable market that we can reliably kind of look and, and forecast, that takes, that's a little bit less time than... Okay, that, 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 that's a, okay, gotcha. I like the damage control you're doing. I'm getting, I'm getting that in trouble, everybody. Okay, um, now, the, I like to like sort of try to figure out, okay, what's noise and what are the signals? Like, you know, separating that. Is corn the one that we watch to lead us out of this, or is that putting to it the whole thing too simplistic? Yeah, I, corn is king. Would be that would be the line of thinking there um, for cereal grains. I think that's definitely one that we need to watch. It's the most. Uh, um, it, it's got the most uh, abundant supplies right now globally. But I, I think you could have the corn market and the oilseed market be very different and you could see them diverge uh, the price the prices diverge so i don't think that you would look to corn to uh, predict the price of canola today that that's not what i would do okay okay that, that's fair that's fair so uh, obviously for canola then we're looking at the whole veg oil complex we're yeah you bet yeah okay so we're looking at definitely soybeans then soybeans yeah uh, vegetable oil demand energies energy is now a very big component of uh, vegetable oil pricing right also corn too through ethanol but energies are, are something that we're watching a lot closer than we did maybe five years ago. Right. And, and the, the whole idea here is, you know, I know you were, I think they were talking about renewable diesel and stuff earlier here today, and we focused on that when we were doing the show in, in Red Deer. That, that's a big part of the demand diversification equation that the, the potentially for the market going forward component. We're, we're probably, so I would say we've seen that demand catch, right? We saw it catch probably last year when the United States doubled the imports of canola oil as uh, that, that was allowed into the biofuel pathway uh, or the biofuel supply chain. So we did see that demand catch, but it's like, it's like a grinding starter. It catches sometimes, right? And then it backs off and grinds and then it catches again, right? And then yep. finally that engine starts running. And that's probably, I think, you know, a lot of the crush capacity here in Canada coming online in 25. You know, so we're still about a year away from that really, like I said, catching on and being steady. Well, we're going to talk for the rest of the show about building that marketing plan, what it looks like, what are the considerations, because I, you know, everybody has different risk tolerances and cash flow requirements. Not all plans are the same, mm -hmm. but we can talk about the variables in general. Are you still, when, I, when we saw each other in Red Deer, you're talking about, I think, defend the castle. Is that how you put it? We're still saying that? Yeah, still defend the castle. I think that there's wealth that's been created in Canada through high, high, uh, high land values, high commodity prices, and so there's this kind of good foundation of wealth in Canada that's been created. We want to defend that now. Okay. Markets naturally want to give and take away, right? We're in the takeaway yeah. phase, so we want to defend against the market taking that wealth away. That was Ed Brzezinski from Cargill Market Sense. We've got more coming up here on Real Lag on the Weekend. You're listening to 650 CKOM and 980 CJME.
Get all the information you need to keep your Pulse crop healthy and profitable with the Pulse School on realagriculture.com. The Pulse School is a free YouTube video series covering agronomy, research, and more across a host of different Pulse crops. It's also available as an audio podcast wherever you download or stream your favorite podcast. Check us out on YouTube or visit realagriculture.com, The Pulse School, brought to you by BSF Canada. The Canola School on realagriculture.com is your one-stop shop for everything a canola grower needs. Check out our free video series on YouTube for all the latest in canola agronomy, research, marketing, and more. Don't have time to watch? Download the podcast version of the Canola School on realagriculture.com or anywhere you download your podcasts. Stay on top of all things canola with the Canola School on realagriculture.com, brought to you by BASF and Invigor Hybrid Canola. Whether you're seeding, harvesting, or anything in between, the Wheat School on realagriculture.com has you covered. Timely agronomic information from industry experts available online anytime. Give your wheat crop a good start and a great finish with the Wheat School on realagriculture.com. Brought to you by CNM Seeds, Syngenta Canada, and the Alberta Wheat and Barley Commission. And welcome back to Real Ag on the Weekend. I'm your host, Sean Haney of realagriculture.com. Y- you know, this week we had the release of the Farm Credit Canada Land Value Report for 2023. And I, I think a lot of people have been w- waiting for this report with a lot of interest in terms of are we going to see land values continue to rise even with the concerns about farm profitability, even with some of the concerns out there in terms of where interest rates are, we're waiting for the Bank of Canada to 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 lower those rates. It seems like we're going to be more patient than maybe we thought or we anticipated heading into 2024, but what would it mean for the land market? And and what we've seen is land values up across Canada 11.5%. Saskatchewan being one of those provinces leading the charge higher. I had a chance to talk to J.P. Gervais, Chief, Chief Economist with Farm Credit Canada, about FCC's findings. Yeah, absolutely. You know, my expectations going in, you know, given what we know about the economic environment for the ag industry, I would have thought that maybe the rate of increase would have been a little bit lower. If uh, actually technically we do have a little bit of a lower rate of increase compared to last year, we had you know, up to last year, we had three consecutive years of the rate of increase going up. So it was an acceleration of the increase in land values. Now, we do have a number that's a little bit lower. It's still double digit uh, growth in land values on average across the country. I'd say we got about two provinces where we can definitely see a little bit of the slowdown. Again, doesn't mean that land values, the market are collab- the market's collapsing, but they definitely the economic factors that you and I have talked about, about for a number of years now with regards to higher interest rates, you know, commodity prices coming down, they're still they look to be playing out. But for the most part, across the board, you still have some very, very strong fundamentals in the marketplace. Yeah, and you know, you look at some of the price of land in, in Ontario up ten point seven percent. That that that's a you know, there's that 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 stuck out to me. Uh, Saskatchewan's still going very very strong, up uh, over fifteen or sixteen percent. And and you mentioned the province. One of the provinces definitely showing a little bit of uh, we're we're kind of cooling off here. Not we're still going up, but we've cooled off on the the rate of increase. Would be Alberta, just under seven percent. Yeah, so for Alberta, we did get a few signs that this was happening in mid-year. So now that's not a surprise necessarily to see the year-end result where we've seen a little, the rate of increase slowing down a little bit. You know, if you look at the Prairie provinces, you were mentioning Saskatchewan as well, you know, with that 15% range. Um, one of the things we like to look at is affordability, right? So you look at the price of land, make some assumptions about if you were to buy land, what kind of payments you would need to, you know, you would make in terms of capital and interest expenses, and compare that to the revenues you can generate off the land. And if you look at Saskatchewan, that ratio is still around, it's at an all-time high, but it's still around 30%, a little over 30%, I believe. And if you compare that to Alberta, again, Alberta average land prices, average revenues, if you think of average yields, average prices, and so forth, you know, you're in that 50% range. So it's not necessarily a surprise to see a province like Alberta, where the rate of increase is slowing down compared to the province of Saskatchewan, where land prices are a little lower, more affordable, and so forth. And you did mention Ontario. 
um, still very strong, above 10%, after two years of roughly 20% increase. And again, that same affordability ratio in Ontario, well, you actually are, you know, you have to allocate more than 100% of your gross revenues, you know, what you can grow off the land in terms of capital payments and interest payments if you were to buy land you know, under some standard assumptions. So um, land's really expensive, but um, demand <laughs> seems very strong. And the reality is that supply is so tight. I mean, there's just not a whole lot available and that just tends to drive prices up. We should have pooled our money together, JP, and just gone and bought some land. That's what we should have done. We <laughs> could have, should have. Well, that's, that's that, you know, I think you, the point being that it's a, if you look over the last so many years, more than 10 years, not only land prices have generated a good, or land has generated a good return, it's also generated a stable return. So when you think of it, right, you're expected any type of assets, when you're looking at a high return, you'd be expected in return of, of taking on a higher return to live with a little bit of volatility. But in the case of ag and the farm economy overall, when it comes to asset values, it's been a good return and stability, which is is, is very unique in some sense. JP, what's going on in British Columbia? It, it's, huh. it's negative on the board. It's down 3.1%. What's happening? Yeah, so we have a region, the South Coast region, where, you know, in, in, in that valley where land prices have been moving down a little bit. So, and that's to be taken with a grain of salt a little bit, right? The range of values in that region is so high, the largest across all the different regions that we monitor across the country. So it's not a surprise that sometimes you'll get a few sales that perhaps are on the lower end of that range that tends to bring the average down year over year. So I, you know, not, you know, I think things are cooling off for sure. Absolutely. I That doesn't worry me too much in terms of the strength of the market. I think demand is still strong, but I mean, we, we do see a, do see a little bit of cooling off from the, the willingness to, to pay from a buyer standpoint. And so I think that some of the high, high values that we have in that area, in that region, sort of explain a little bit of why we have a little bit of a decline. So who's buying the land? Is it, you know, because what, what people, some people will jump to is, well, this is, you know, pension funds and outside, you know, foreign investors, uh, any, any insights there on what's driving the, the land market? Yeah. So a couple of things. We'll never be sure a hundred percent, like with a, a, a precise statistic when it comes to buyers, because it's, you know, we, we look at sales, not just the sales that we, that we finance at the FCC, but overall sales, but we're never sure to be capturing a hundred percent of all the sales that are happening out there. Right. So that's one thing, but Bottom line, if I, the quick answer to your question is producers, I mean, it's farming operations that are buying land. Now, we can deny as well that over the last couple of years, there's more and more buyers that are not farming the land. Uh, and I would say that range is around 15%. So you'd see a little bit more of that activity in some provinces, a little bit less than others, but around 15% of buyers that are not going to farm the land is what we have in a data set. Uh, those are not transactions that we finance, but nonetheless, transactions are in that are in the database. So for the more vast majority of the transactions that we have in a database, that's farm operations buying land. Uh, but yes, I mean, absolutely over the last couple of years, certainly and that's actually, we've been kind of just trying to assess this for the last couple of years. We have a little bit more of an interest from, from non-traditional buyers, I would call that, but mm. um, still for the most part, by farm operations that are buying. There's another category though, too, it is the, the 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 farmer being you know the, the farmer of the land but you know I, I don't know what phrase i should use but like a front or you know they have outside investors that are funding the the farm making the purchases and that's hard to quantify too but th that is becoming more of a, a a popular thing in the industry as well no different sources of capital for sure and and i think it speaks to for me personally you know, i think it speaks to the outlook that most businesses have for overall in Canada. I mean, yeah. we do have challenges in front of us for sure. There's some, some things that we have to, to work towards, you know, we're trying to get our productivity up and all those type of things. But I mean, you look at the outlook for the industry, the fact is that more capital has come in in the industry. And I think that overall is a good thing. Now, it does raise a few questions when it comes to, for example, young farmers or businesses that are trying to establish themselves, expand their land base. Because as I said, I mean, when it comes to affordability in most provinces, we are at a record high in that 
that negative way in a sense that the least affordable ever when you look at land prices relative to farm revenues considering where interest rates are so there's no denying that it makes it harder for young producers harder for small businesses to expand and so forth but nonetheless i think more capital is coming in in the ag sector because it's a sector that has a promising future yeah and the other thing that we have seen in some of our real agri studies work is that although farmers are negative in terms of now being the right time to invest capital clearly your numbers are showing that the the land market is is out you know outside of some of that negativity and we and we've also seen that you know farmers the the largest farmers are the ones most interested on intentions to buy land or have bought land um and so it kind of feeds some of that narrative too i think at the big get bigger which is you know based on the size of the money required to invest here that kind of makes sense as sort of you alluded to that, that does make sense and then your data says it i mean if you look at the census data as well it says it in terms of like what the kind of distribution of farm size that we have now in the industry i think that's there's no denying that we're trending in one direction now i'm not suggesting it's a good thing or a bad thing i'm just saying that it's you know we are at a point when you look at land prices and that's the least close if not in all provinces in most provinces the least affordable that it's ever been so it, it, it says something about you know where how well people feel about the future of ag because i think the need and then there are economies of scale and you know we need to optimize how we run the business and then so forth and it all gives reasons to buy you know and, and different businesses will have different strategies and different plan as well so yeah if you look at the the increase, you know, across the country, eleven and a half percent, and you know, even with drought in Western Canada, you know, we got Saskatchewan up healthy. Even with you know interest rates being an issue, and there's you know the the markets you know being a concern in the back half of twenty three for sure, as they continue to be in twenty four. It, it it does speak to the fact that overall the the farmer is still very willing to invest in something they're not making more of, as my grandpa yeah. used to say. It, it's it's land. Well, that's very true on the supply side, that's for sure. Uh, yeah, I mean, if you look at the calendar year twenty twenty three, because that's how we work the the land value steady. Yeah. If you look at the calendar year in Saskatchewan, receipts of grains and oil season pulses went up six percent calendar year. Now, of course. The back end or that that second half is going to be a little bit weaker because of some of the dry conditions that we had. And I think if you look at the forecast for 2014, then maybe and just maybe this is when we actually see a little bit of more of a, of a slowdown. Because if you look at the forecast right now, we're saying basically receipts of grazing oil seeds and pulses could fall by about 14 percent in 2024. That's because of lower commodity prices. That's because of the drag that 23 production is going to bring into 2024 for the first half of the year. So all of that together, maybe that's one of the years when we have a little bit of a slowdown interest rates. We're going to get some relief, but that's going to be towards the second half of the year. And, you know, a lot of operations will still have to price debt at a higher rate than what they have currently in the books. So all of that together, maybe that's, you know, what we're seeing BC, what we're seeing in Alberta, and maybe a little bit of a, a, a kind of a heads up or kind of a little bit of an advanced warning, kind of a lead indicator of what could happen. But the bottom line is tight supply just plays a huge role. I think that's one of the things then when farm income was increasing, we kept, and I did that, you know, I kept saying that, well, farm income, low interest rates are kind of fueling some of that demand. But I think we kind of pushed aside kind of the, on the supply side, not only we're not making any more of land, but bottom line is that there's less and less available for sale and so that's just like when something comes up uh you know the the, yeah it's there's quite a bit of an interest in terms of bids so that was jp gervais chief economist with farm credit canada it was interesting when he points out that saskatchewan although the prices you know really led the charge higher when it comes to land value improvement still remains on a value perspective, still one of the best buys in, in Canada based on some of those numbers. It was interesting at the car kill event in Saskatoon this week. I, I made that point uh, during the recording of uh, Real Ag Radio, and then I was the also the after-dinner speaker, and I had mentioned it again, and somebody else from the crowd, quit telling people that. <laughs> it's like, this is our secret. Please keep it so. We don't need a whole bunch of people coming here. So uh, pushing those land values higher. So I thought that was pretty funny. Okay, we're going to take a break. We'll be back with more here of Real Egg on the weekend. Of course, you're listening to 650 CKOM and 980 CJME.
I'm Lindsay Smith from realagriculture.com. Join me Monday nights for The Agronomist, a one-hour live and interactive show broadcast across YouTube, Facebook, and X. Monday nights at 8 p.m. Eastern, I host expert agronomists from all over the country to give you answers to some of the toughest agronomic questions. Join us live or catch the replay Tuesday morning. That's The Agronomist with me, Lindsay Smith, Monday nights live at 8 p.m. Eastern. Hi, I'm Bernard Tobin, host of the Soybean School on realagriculture.com. Throughout the year, on the Soybean School, we'll bring you timely agronomic video content from planting to harvest, from the latest agronomic research to the latest in production technology. Check out our massive video library on YouTube, realagriculture.com, or download the audio podcast versions wherever you get your podcasts. The Soybean School is brought to you by BASF and Syngenta Canada. And welcome back to Real Ag on the weekend. Uh, in January, we asked farmers h- about how different policy decisions impact their operation, okay, positively or negatively. One of those was free trade agreements and market access. And it kind of fascinating results. And I'm interested in what your feedback is on it. it so... In January, when we asked Canadian farmers and ranchers about how they view certain policies impacting their operations, 20% of producers believe that trade and market access has a very positive impact, and 32% believe the impact is slightly positive. So that's 52% saying positive impact. In comparison, 31% said trade and market access were neutral in impact, while 12% said it was slightly negative impact, and 5% said it had a very negative negative impact on the farm. Per- personally, I'm kind of surprised that only 52% view trade deals and market access as having a positive impact on their operation, given Canada's overall reliance on, on exports of, of things like, like just, you know, livestock and 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 some of the crops we're producing and, and you know i mentioned the the meeting in, 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 in with the cargill group in in saskatoon this week I, I had joked i said you know canadians can only eat so many lentils right or beef or pork you know and given canada's level of production it's paramount that americans asians indians and europeans are consuming canadian products just think back to B- the BSE crisis and the impact it had on the Canadian cattle industry when the Canada-U.S. border closed. We tried to eat our way out of it. It was crazy. It was really the- – and the Canadian consumer did step up. But to do that on a weekly basis going forward, no way. We'd have to dial back our production. It- you know, In my speeches and keynotes this winter, audiences have expressed concern – that it's Canada's importation of agricultural products that could be creating the concern for some producers. And for example, I think this is one that really comes to mind a lot. This In the CETA agreement, it allows for the imports of European cheeses, and yet Canada struggles to send beef into the region due to non-tariff trade barriers. The, the same thing is happening again with trying to set up this trade deal with the UK. So Real Agri Studies is going to continue to, to dig deeper into how different segments of producers responded to the question on trade and other policy topics in the coming months. So stay tuned for that. But I'm interested in what you think. Do, do you view trade and market access as something that positively impacts your farm? Or would you prefer there be less focus on trade? And you know we're broadcasting here on Rolco uh, across Saskatchewan. I, I think, and I have not dug into the provincial responses of the data, but I'm thinking Saskatchewan that you are really more. You're higher than the national average. But I could be wrong. I would love to hear from you. If you have feedback on this topic or any other, I want to hear from you. Okay, my email address is shaney at realagriculture dot com. You can also find us across all the social media platforms. You're also more than welcome to call the Real Ag Feedback Line, and that number is 855-776-6147. Hope everybody has a great rest of their weekend. Thank you so much for getting real and getting connected with Real Ag on the Weekend. I'm your host, Sean Haney of realagriculture.com. 
and we'll chat with you again next week. Cheers, everybody.